Hey guys, as we're talking about this subject of Easter, I want you to know that Easter is about a very specific event, right? It's not about um, uh, celebrating the church. It's not about celebrating Christianity. It's really not even just celebrating Jesus in a general way. Easter is about a very specific event. And without this event, there'd be no Easter and there would be no church. Easter is about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Easter is about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so what we have here is you wouldn't even know. See, it's not about the great teachings that Jesus did or even the miracles that Jesus did. The truth is we wouldn't know anything about that if it wasn't for this event, the resurrection, the resurrection. And so this morning, what I want to do is unpack the story of the resurrection. Uh, what really what happened from the time that Jesus was resurrected and kind of moving forward because this story changes everything. And so it's amazing to me how many people haven't actually read the story. I mean, how many people have never ever taken the time to really read the story about what happened uh, on that Easter morning? And many intellectual people, really smart people, many times they read that story for the first time and they're like, you know, it really blows their mind because it doesn't read like a a, a fable. It doesn't read like some kind of a, a, a story that somebody made up because there's all these interesting, incredible, details in it. Now, one of the most amazing, one of the most revealing things in the story is the fact that there are no heroes in this story. As a matter of fact, there's not only are there no heroes in the story, uh, none of Jesus's followers expected a resurrection. None of Jesus's followers expected a resurrection on that Sunday morning. And, and so when you read this story, uh, um, uh, the, how Jesus died, his everybody went home. Everybody went home. They were not expecting a resurrection, right? After Jesus died, they put him in the tomb and all of his faithful followers, Peter and Andrew, and James, John, Mary, Martha, all of them, right? They went home. They, they, it would have been a good story if, if all the faithful followers, if they gathered outside that tomb, right? And they were just waiting for the resurrection. Jesus is coming back. And that would have been really cool but it's just not what happened, right? They weren't there when Jesus was resurrected because they thought Jesus was dead and they expected him to stay dead. So this story right out the get-go, I want you to understand has no examples really of men and women of extraordinary faith. They responded to Jesus's death the same way you would expect anybody to respond when they saw somebody die right before their eyes. When Jesus died, all of his followers thought Jesus would stay dead. They thought that Jesus would stay dead. Now, even though they saw the miracles, even though they heard the teachings, even though he walked on water, all of Jesus' followers, when he died, they did not think that he was coming back again. I mean, he was a great man, but yeah, he's just another wannabe Messiah. He was a better speaker than anybody that we've ever heard. He was a, a, a miracle worker. He did all this, but game over, man. Jesus is dead. Now in this story, when you read the story of Easter, nobody wrote Peter in as a hero, right? Nobody wrote Andrew in as a hero. They're just a bunch of people who lost hope, lost faith, and they were scared. Just like you would have done. And just like I would have done. That's one of the things that makes this story so compelling and so true. So I'm gonna take up the story. I'm gonna start in Luke chapter 23 and verse 50. Luke 23 and verse 50. It says this, now behold, there was a man named Joseph, a council member, a good and just man. Now this uh, Joseph, uh, he's a religious leader. He's part of the group of people that, uh, um, that crucified Jesus. But we kind of find out that he's kind of a secret follower of Jesus, right? Look at verse 51. It says he had not consented to their decision indeed. In other words, he wasn't down with what they did to Jesus. He was from Arimathea, a, a, a city of Jews who himself was also waiting for the kingdom of God. I love that expression. It says he was waiting for the kingdom of God. I, his guy kept saying, God is going to send us the Messiah. It's been 400 years since God has even sent us a prophet, but God is going to send us a Messiah. This is a guy that did not give up hope. Look at verse 52 and 53. 
It says, this man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then he took it down, wrapped it in linen, and laid it in a tomb that was hewn out of the rock where no one had ever lain before. This is a, a brand new tomb, a, a brand new cut in the rock. It's meant for a wealthy person. Only rich people get buried in, in graves like this. So Joseph gets the body, he wraps it in linen cloth, and he puts it in this tomb. Now you need to know this before we go on. The, the proper way to bury somebody in that day, in the first century, you take the body, you wash the body, you anoint the body with all these fragrances and all these oils, and then you wrap the body in this cloth, right? That was just described here in our text, and it's saturated in oils and all fragrances, and they do all of this to prepare the body and put it in the tomb. But there was a problem. This was the day uh, uh, before Passover. And they had to do whatever they were gonna do before sunset. So they're in a hurry. And generally, if I'm just being honest with you, women were the ones who washed and prepared a body for the funeral. But this is a bunch of guys, man, and they're in a hurry because it's that Passover. And so like men sometimes do, they missed out on some of those details that women usually take care of. They wrap, they have to hurry up, wrap them in the cloth, put them in the tomb, because it's about to be the Passover. Look at verse number 50, uh, 54, Luke 23, 54. It says, that day was the preparation and the Sabbath drew near. Now the reason why they call it uh, preparation day uh, is because the Sabbath is about to begin. So uh, at sunset, so whatever you had to do, you had to get done on that day. I mean, you need to fill up your car on gas, you do it on preparation day, whatever groceries you need to pick up, you do it right then. So there's this kind of this hurry, 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 hurry. We got to get this thing done. We got to bury Jesus before sunset and we got to hurry up because uh, the Passover is, the Sabbath is beginning. Now look at verse number 55. It says, and the women who had come with him from Galilee followed after, and they observed the tomb and how his body was laid. So there's this group of women, they see Jesus, right? How he's taken down from the cross, hurriedly buried, and they're thinking, man, that's not right. Like, that's not right. It's not okay. That's not how you do it. That's not the proper way to bury somebody. Now, granted, Jesus isn't who we had hoped he would be. I mean, yeah, great teacher, great miracle worker, but he is clearly just dead and not the Messiah. But they think our Jesus deserves a proper burial. So when these women accompany Joseph to the tomb, they see the spot, they see the place, right? And so, um, and by the way, the tomb, when they got to the tomb, uh, this is a place that was cut into rock like a cave. And there's this big stone that's placed in the opening. I mean, imagine a big wagon wheel uh, stone, big round stone that would be, uh, they would have a wedge and it would be rolled into place, right? Giant, heavy, big, right? And they would seal it. And they would seal it just in case somebody tried to get in there or anything like that. And in this particular case, when they buried Jesus, they placed two Roman guards at the entrance of this tomb. Right, because the Jewish leaders were like, hey, this Jesus that we just crucified, his followers might come try to take his body and claim some kind of crazy resurrection story. So, and that'll just make everything worse. We just got rid of Jesus. And so uh, uh, we need to make sure that nobody messes with the body. So they stationed these soldiers outside at the tomb. So all these women, these women see this taking place and they're distraught. We can't give Jesus a proper burial. So that's why they do what they do next. Look at verse number 56. Look at verse number 56. It says, Then they returned and prepared spices and fragrant oils, and they rested on the Sabbath according to the commandment. Now, why did they prepare spices and perfumes? Well, because they thought Jesus was dead, and they expected Jesus to stay dead. They just wanted to give him a proper burial. So what happens is uh, they're doing all this stuff, getting everything ready, and then once the Sabbath starts, they stop. Right? And Sabbath day again, you can't do any work on it. So they wait that entire day. They even, they get up as early as they can. They go to the tomb to give Jesus a proper burial. Now look at Luke 24 and verse number one. It says, now on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain other women with them came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared. Why did they go to the tomb? Because they expected to find a body there. Luke 24 and verse 2 says, but they found the stone, the stone rolled away from the tomb. The stone was rolled. It's not like it was like moved over a little. The stone rolled away. In, in the original language, it means like yonder. It has been rolled away, away. Look at verse number three. It says, then they went in and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. 
They expected a body to be there. Why? Because they thought Jesus was dead and they expected him to stay dead and stay in the tomb. Look at verse number four. And it happened as they were greatly perplexed about this, that behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. I mean, look at the details of this. Nobody's like, oh, wow, Jesus is resurrected. This is awesome. It doesn't even cross their minds. It never occurs to them that Jesus is back from the dead. They're staring at the empty tomb. They don't know what's going on. Or, is this the right tomb? Are we in the right place? One, two, three. Yeah, this is the right tomb. We're in the right place. But where is Jesus? And then these two men standing there in shining garments, these angels. One translation says they were gleaming like lightning. Look at verse five. It says, then as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, they said to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? Great question. Why do you seek the living among the dead? Yes, Mary, would you like to answer? Because we thought he was dead and we expected him to stay that way, right? In fact, we didn't just think he was dead. We know that he was dead. We watched him die. We watched him be put to death. Remember, uh, look at verse six. And they said, he is not here, but is risen. Remember, remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee saying, the son of man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified. And the third day rise again. Look guys, write this down. Jesus had predicted his own death, burial and resurrection. Jesus absolutely predicted his own death, burial, and resurrection. But his followers, are like kind of like us sometimes when we hear bad news, they didn't want to hear it, man. So it's almost like his followers, like, no, 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 Jesus. Jesus like, hey, I'm going to die. I'm going to be crucified. This is coming. This is going to happen. But on the third day, I'm going to rise again. And they're like, blah, 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 blah. Jesus, nothing can happen to you, Jesus. How could anything go wrong with you? Jesus, you know what people are thinking. You walked on the water. You've brought the dead back to life. You, you made food appear out of nowhere. You've helped blind people to see. Lord, you have done all these amazing things. Nobody is ever going to take you out. So these followers, man, they just never heard. They they, they heard what he, the words he was saying, but they did not hear what he was telling him. But look at verse number eight. It says, and they remembered his words. And they remember what he said. And they're like, man, Jesus is back from the dead. Jesus said he was coming back and Jesus is back. And it just blows their mind, right? And so they drop their oils and their spices. They run back to tell everybody, right? Because they're going to find the disciples and tell them Jesus is back. And they knew exactly where to find the disciples. Why did they know where to find the disciples? Because they were hiding, huddled up with some, all the followers gathered together because they had a real dilemma. And the dilemma was this, right? The dilemma was this. If they, if the Romans took out Jesus, our leader, what are they going to do to us? If the Romans killed Jesus, won't they kill us too? But look at verse number nine. It says, then they returned from the tomb and told all these things to the 11 and to all the rest. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, the mother of James, and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. Again, here's some more details, man, to help you know this story is true. Amazing, but true. See, if this was made up, or like some people try to say, written hundreds of years later, right? Like some, it wasn't, but some people say that, right? By the time that this was made up and written, Peter would have been a rock star of the early church. A, a couple of a hundred years from this point, uh, uh, Peter, they would have been naming uh, uh, cathedrals after him at that point if they were making this story up. I mean, think about it. This is Andrew, John, Matthew, Peter, the stallions of the early church movement. These are the men, right, that we're going to name our children after. So when the women come back to these great men of faith and they're like, he is risen. He, Jesus is back, man. Look what they, verse 11. And it says, and their words seemed uh, to them like idle tales and they did not believe them. They didn't believe them. Why? Because they weren't expecting a resurrection. It wasn't even in their vocabulary. It wasn't on their radar. Man, they saw Jesus die and they expected him to stay dead, right? They didn't just see him die, man. They watched him bleed to death. He was almost dead before they ever even nailed him to the cross. They watched him suffer and bleed and die. And they're like, and you women, 
your words seem like nonsense. But look at verse number 12. But Peter, thinking it's nonsense, arose and ran to the tomb. And stooping down, he saw the linen cloths lying by themselves. And he departed, marveling to himself at what had happened. Peter, who was not expecting a resurrection, ran to the tomb. And he's amazed, right? He's wondering what's happened. It doesn't make sense. And then Peter is staring into that tomb. And he's asking himself, what if he really did come back? What if Jesus really did rise from the dead? Because if he rose from the dead, this is a game changer, right? It changes everything. Write this down. Because if Jesus really rose from the dead, then everything he said about himself is true. If he rose from the dead, everything he said about himself is true. And if everything that Jesus said about himself is true, that means that everything that Jesus said about God the Father is true. Right. That means that everything that he said about having a relationship uh, with his heavenly father and his own death, burial and resurrection, all of that is true. It means that everything that Jesus taught about having a relationship with God was true. It means that everything that Jesus said. Right. So what he said about his death, burial and resurrection is true. That means that when he says that our sins can be forgiven, that's true too. And that's good news for Peter because Peter knows that if my sins can be forgiven, if Jesus is who he said he is, and that's true because he was resurrected from the dead, that means that even my sin of denying Christ on the day, on the night that they put him on trial and denying him to some little girl who I should have been able to ignore, but I didn't, right? And I cursed and I denied Christ. Even that sin can be forgiven. If he rose from the dead, that means that what he said about his own death being payment for the sins of the whole world is absolutely true. And I can be forgiven. Anyone can be forgiven. If he rose from the dead, that means, in fact, he is the unique son of God, the lamb of God. And this changes everything, everything. And we know from what happens in the next few weeks that Peter, uh, Peter's conclusion from going that day and looking at an empty tomb, right? As he went back to find his friends, his conclusion is the body isn't stolen. This isn't some fluke. We didn't go to the wrong tomb. But in fact, that Jesus has risen from the dead. And later on, Peter saw and talked to and walked with Jesus. In fact, he was so convinced that Jesus had come back to life that just a few weeks later, not years later, months later, a few weeks later, right there in Jerusalem, there's this event that brings everybody out of the restaurants, out of their businesses, out into the streets, out of the school. Everybody pours into the streets of Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost when this event happened. And everybody's like, what is going on? And in that moment, this same Peter who did not understand what the women were say, saying, who did not even have resurrection really in his vocabulary. It wasn't a thought in his mind. Jesus died, man. He's going to stay dead. But he saw the empty tomb and he walked with and he talked with a risen Savior. That Peter, no expectation of the resurrection. From that conclusion of looking in the empty tomb, seeing Jesus with his own eyes, here's Peter's sermon to all those people. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 22. He said, men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did through him in your midst as you yourselves know. Right? He's saying, guys, let me tell you what's going on here. You remember Jesus? Don't tell me you don't remember Jesus. The one that you handed over to be crucified. Right? You saw the miracles. You, you ate the bread. You were there when he did these things. You know who I'm talking about. Jesus, this man sent from God. Look at verse 23. He says, him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands, crucified and put to death. Right? You talk about being bold. Peter's telling these thousands of people. He's saying, you nailed Jesus to the cross. You know it. You did it, didn't you? You. These are men and women that lived right there in the vicinity. These are men and women that saw the crucifixion, right? These are men and women that were gathered on the hillside when Jesus fed the 5,000. These are men and women who heard the Sermon on the Mount. These are men and women who saw and knew Jesus. They knew his followers. They knew Jesus' as mama. And Peter stands up a few weeks after the resurrection and says, let me tell you what happened right in front of you. Right, right in front of you. You handed over an innocent man sent by God to the Romans to be crucified. 
And look at verse 24. He said, referring to Jesus says, whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it's not possible that he should be held by it. God raised him up. He's been raised from the dead. Peter's saying, you want to know what I know? And again, again, a few weeks after the resurrection, this isn't like months. This isn't years later, just a few weeks. And, and Peter's staking his life on. It's like he knows these people can crucify him just like they did Jesus. And he's saying, because I've seen a risen, resurrected Savior, I know, I am sure, I am convinced. We are all absolutely convinced that this Jesus, Jesus, whom you crucified has come back to life and he has risen from the dead. Look at verse 32. This Jesus God has raised up of which we are all witnesses. We have seen the resurrected Savior. See, that's important because he's not saying it because, you know, he's not saying that we believe it. We believe it because uh, uh, somebody taught it to us. He's not saying we believe it right? Because uh, somebody laid it out for us. He's saying, we believe it, man, because we saw it. This isn't some philosophy that we ascribe to, right? We seen it. We're eyewitnesses. We're telling you what we saw with our very eyes on that Sunday morning. Now, this is so good. Now, you have to understand that in this culture, what he's about to say is either absolutely true. In that day, what he's about to say is either absolutely true or it's blasphemy. And he could be strung up, stoned to death at any moment. It's either true or absolute blasphemy. Peter's either crazy, I mean, he's got a death wish, or he is absolutely convinced about the reality of what he's saying. Look at verse 36. He says, therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Maybe at this moment, a hush fell over the crowd. Because there's a decision to make now. People have to think about what Peter's telling them. Do we crucify? We get the Romans to crucify Peter and the rest of these guys like we did Jesus. Do we stone Peter? Is this blasphemy or is it true? This is a group of people who could have walked to the spot where Jesus was buried and found out for themselves that there was an empty tomb. This is a group of people who saw the miracles. They saw Jesus. Many of them were at the crucifixion. And again, weeks, not months later or years later. And this crowd of thousands, their response to this blasphemous statement that Jesus, whom you crucified, is the Messiah and the Savior of the world. What was their response? Verse 37. He said, now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. And said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? It says they were cut to the heart. What that means is no matter how much they didn't like it, they couldn't resist. They could not resist the truth of what Peter was saying. They knew that what Peter was saying was absolutely true. They're saying, Peter, you're right. We were wrong about Jesus, right? We're guilty for handing him over to the Romans. Peter, we are responsible for the death of Jesus. And Peter replied to them and he replies to you and he replies to me, to all of us who stand at a place who are willing to say, you know what? I've been wrong, man. I've been wrong about who Jesus is. I've been wrong about what scripture says about who Jesus is, right? Maybe you never paid attention to the story. Maybe you didn't have all the facts, right? Maybe you've just been running for it and denying it, right? Maybe you're choosing not to deal with the resurrected Jesus. Acts chapter two, verse 38, Peter said to them what we need to hear this morning. Peter said to them, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of of your sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This is amazing. By the way, Peter had every reason to be mad at this crowd. These are the people that handed his Jesus over to be crucified. They killed his master, but Peter knew that he shared responsibility too, man, that Peter was in on this because in the moment when he could have done something for Jesus being arrested, right? When he was warming himself by that fire, he said, I don't even know who he is. I don't know the man. And so Peter tells them, let me tell you what you got to do. You got to do what I did. Number one, write this down. You got to, you got to repent. You must repent, right? That means you change your mind about who Jesus is, about you, who you are, what he says about your sin and turn from your sin and turn to the resurrected Messiah, the savior of the world. And then Peter, the second thing he said is you need to be baptized. 
you need to be baptized. That's Peter's way of saying, you got to go public, man. Not only do you repent, turn from your sin, right? But you publicly, boldly proclaim your faith and trust in the resurrected Savior. You got to go public. Peter's telling them that by repenting and trusting Jesus, that they can be forgiven of their sins. I mean, think about it. These are the people responsible for killing Jesus, for handing him over. And Peter's saying, man, you can be forgiven. He said, he said, because I'm convinced of who Jesus is, because I'm convinced of what Jesus has done, the death, burial, and resurrection, that even the, son, the, the sin of turning over the Son of God, even the sin of crucifying the Son of God, murdering the Son of God, that sin can be forgiven. I'm absolutely convinced because I've met a resurrected Jesus. He says, repent, be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. That's why we all need to hear, man, your sin isn't so great, so big that you can't be forgiven. Now get this. And on that day, that day, over 3,000 Jewish people who could have walked to the tomb, who could have interviewed Mary, who could have pinned Matthew up against the wall and said, hey, tax collector, tell us the truth. Did Jesus come back from the dead? Tell us what really happened. Over 3,000 men and women who had the potential to be eyewitnesses to the crucifixion, 3,000 people in that moment declared, we believe that Jesus is Christ, the Son of God, the Savior of the world. And, they, and the church began to baptize hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of Jewish people who said, we believe that Jesus is resurrected and he's the messiah that we've been looking for and in that day the church exploded and the days that followed the church continued to grow read the book of acts thousands upon thousands coming to saving knowledge of jesus christ as the resurrected lord and savior right where all these events happen and then it spread out from there it left jerusalem and went to the uh to rome and to the rest of europe and then some time ago somebody got in a ship crossed the most dangerous ocean in the world and they brought the gospel message to this continent. And here we are, man, in strange circumstances with everything going on, celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ because of events that literally happened over 2,000 years ago. And if there's something in your heart, man, that says that's true, if there's something in your heart that says, I believe this, what should you do? Peter's words are still true for you today. It's simple. Change your mind. Turn. Declare that you've been wrong about who you are and about who Jesus is and trust him as your Lord and Savior, right? And then follow through and say, I want to say publicly that I believe in Jesus Christ as my Lord. I'm not ashamed of him. I'm going to follow through with baptism. Each and every one of us, each and every one of you, man, because I've decided you have to make up your mind about who Jesus is and, and, and whether or not to make that decision public. What better way to end an Easter celebration than to give men, women, boys and girls an opportunity to do, man, what those people did that morning? Why? Because of the events that literally happened on that Easter Sunday morning. When Peter saw an empty tomb and then he met a resurrected Savior, which meant that anybody, anywhere, anytime can be forgiven of their sins. So that's what I want to do right now. I want to close our service. I want to give you an opportunity, man, to trust Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And, and maybe you have difficulty with that. Maybe you feel like there's some things in your life that aren't okay. And you know that you're not right with God, but something's been holding you back. Maybe it's your shame, man. Maybe it's your guilt. Maybe, uh, you, maybe you feel like somehow you have sinned too much for God. That's not true. It hasn't happened. If the sin of crucifying the Savior of the world can be forgiven, you can be forgiven too. So what are you going to do? Will you do what those people did that day? Will you repent, turn from your sin? Maybe you could just pray a prayer like this right there where you're at. You could simply say, Father God, I'm a sinner. Lord, I have sinned. I've done so much, but I believe in your resurrected son. So Lord, I repent. I turn from my sin and I'm turning to Jesus. Save me, Jesus. Tell him, say, Lord, I'm putting my faith in the truth 
the reality of a resurrected Savior. I'm putting my faith and trust in your death, burial, and resurrection. Save me, Jesus. Why don't you pray that prayer right now? Listen, if you've got any questions about salvation, maybe you just prayed that prayer right now. There's a, a, a comment that's pinned to the top of this post. Why don't you see, all you need to do is go hit like on that uh, comment, right? And we will contact you. We'll say, hey man, how can we pray for you? Right? What can we do for you? Can we help you take next steps? Do you have any questions? So here's, here's my, uh, my call out for you. If you just pray to receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, hit like on that comment that's pinned to the top. If you have questions about trusting Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior, if you want some more information, hit like. We'll comment. We'll, we'll, we'll follow up with you. If you've got just questions, man, just let us know. We'll be glad to answer any question that you have. Maybe you're here this morning and you have something that you need us to pray for you about. Well, in the comments there, why don't you just type pray? Just the word pray. Pray, right? And uh, I'll DM you and, and uh, ask you about your prayer request. You can let me know whatever it is, or we can keep it confidential, and I'll pray for you. Maybe there's some other question that you have you'd like for us to follow up uh, with you. Man, just comment below or send a church, us a direct message right here to the church. We want you to know this Easter Sunday more than ever before that Jesus is alive, that he loves you, that he cares about you, and that the resurrection changes everything. Listen, guys, let's go back to Scott Diffie and close with some worship.